What is up, everybody? This is Marshall Lee of Donkey Jaw Projects, and this is going to sound weird, but this is the 100th episode of the Escape Artist Podcast, <laughs> aka a YouTube video. Um, I've been I've done that podcast for a long time, but the last few episodes have been like a year in between each episode. Um, <laughs> so, man, that's nothing to slot yet. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. But, um, you know, I got a, a lot of my friends on the podcast. Jeff Lafferty was on there. Um, just a lot of people, Gaz Spot was on at one point. Um, I even got um, an old friend of yours, Mr. Jersey Joe's. He was on there. Um, Rob Stenzinger. A lot of people have been on it, but I wanted to just kind of finish it off. I couldn't help it, but like be a little OCD about it. I'm like, I got to at least get to a hundred. I'm at 90 something, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I got to get Kevin on for the last episode. So we're, we're making it a thing. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. So uh, if you can't tell already Kevin's here. <laughs> what's up everybody? Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Marsh, I'm really stoked that you asked me to be on here. I haven't talked to you for, for a good long minute. Yes, sir. I'm like, excited too, for sure. Um, I've been actually wanting to do this this um, topic for a long time, even way back in the art cat when the art casters was or with the um, art and story stuff was going on. I always was like, oh, I want to talk to Kevin about this stuff. So <laughs> it's been a long time coming. Yeah, I know but, we've had some conversations about you know like a long time ago, kind of about how hip hop and and punk rock kind of came up around the same time. And there's there's a lot of uh, analogous points in, in the two genres histories, I think. So yeah. Well, I'm um, yeah. Ahead of what you want to talk about. <laughs> no, no, that's that's cool. It's it's all it's all cool. Um, yeah, uh, we we have chatted about that from time to time, but yeah, I guess right at the top, let's at least. Um, I mean, if anybody watches my channel, they probably watch your channel <laughs> um, and know about you. But just in case there's somebody out there who doesn't know who you are, let let's uh, let everybody know uh, where who you are and what where your link is or whatever. <laughs> um, Kevin Cross, I've uh, been an illustrator for. 18 years or so now um, I've done a bunch of stuff in comics never you know never became a name in comics but you know inked been a colorist pencil I've uh, you know done a, everything actually you know <laughs> from lettering and everything um, so I've always been interested in comics for sure um, a little while ago, I accidentally started this thing called 100 Days of Making Comics. <laughs> and that was because I was getting really fed up with uh, a lot of what was going on at the time with my illustration career. Uh, funny enough, I find myself back in that same spot. because <laughs> 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 My life has changed quite quite a bit. Um, but uh, I, I'm still you know, working on my own comics, uh, coming out very slowly. Um, you know, just because life stuff. Um, anyway, so yeah, a lot of illustration, a lot of comics, things like that in my background. Uh, before that, I went, well, I went to art school late in life or later mm -hmm. than most people go to college anyway. Uh, I waited 10 years until, you know, from high school to college. And in that meantime, uh, I was playing in a bunch of bands and going on tour, putting out records, a bunch of punk bands, mostly kind of your Reagan era, 1980s hardcore type punk stuff. And uh, yeah, putting out records, going on tour and everything. And then uh, about 10 years or so into that, I started thinking like, hmm, what if this punk thing doesn't become a viable career? <laughs> um, in between tours, I'm going to start going to college. And I thought, because I'm a smart guy, I was like, ha, I'm going to go to art school. That sounds like a good backup plan. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I was uh, going to tour, and I'd find, like, the local comic shop or whatever town we were in and, you know, pick up a trade or a graphic novel or something like that. And 
And, you know, like, like most people who do this stuff, you know, it's kind of the cliche I've been drawn since I can remember and all that kind of thing. And, you know, even though, uh, my focus was music for a long time, uh, it was a style of rock and roll that is not ever going to probably <laughs> for most people pay a lot of bills, you know? And, uh, so, you know, I continued to draw and stuff and uh, everything and then just thought, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet, go to art school. And so, and now here I am 18 years later. <laughs> there you go. Balder, <laughs> more bearded, less punk looking, still doing it, doing it all. Yeah. That's cool, man. Everybody, everybody's got their way of going about it. And I mean, I wish I went to um, art school. I, I did a lot of things. I went to different schools and never actually ended up fulfilling any kind of art degree but I feel like as much as I'm like kind of glad I didn't go to art school Dude, for, I have so much for, to say about that now I'm glad you didn't either. <laughs> well I'm glad but at the same time I know that I'm the type of person who would have benefited from it and I, I've heard you talk about it in the past where kind of similarly like it kind of helps you get that discipline that you might not have you know had otherwise or whatever and learn some things you might not have Learn. Yeah, there's so many benefits to art school, uh, um, you know, and that could, that would probably be a, a podcast all its all its own, you know, if you wanted to go there. But um, it the thing about art school is, if anyone wants to go, it is so expensive. Yeah, like, it is so expensive. And at the time that I was going, it was it, it was in an era where that's kind of you know what people thought, oh, well, you're supposed to go to college. You have to go to college. Um, you know, and then fast forward to where we are today, and uh, most of my friends who are the most successful are the ones who didn't go to college. Right. You know, I mean, yeah, I benefited quite a bit, but when I went to college, there wasn't YouTube. Um, you know, I when I first started college, I didn't even have a computer. You know, it was it was... Late 90s, so, you know, the internet was around for sure. But, you know, like, half of me and my friends and family didn't have a computer, you know. Yeah. Like, the internet at that point was still kind of like a, a novelty, it seemed like. Like, it was, because it was so expensive to just buy a computer and just be online, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all had landlines and no smartphones and, you know. We used to have to kill bears to eat and be warm, and um, you know it was just a different time. So I went to art school, and uh, you know I was I was like a C student in high school, not because I think I'm stupid, but because I didn't care, to be honest, right. you know. And uh, so here I am going to school, and I actually care. So, and I'm not one of those rich kids who got to go to college and not take loans, and they get to go leave art school and you know, mumsy and dadsy of pay for everything, you know? So it was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to kick ass, you know? And so I made really, really good grades and I learned a lot and I paid, you know, I was, I was semi a model student, even though I have a loud mouth and, you know, whatever, I still did my homework and paid attention and, and all kinds of stuff. And that, that really worked out. But regardless of all that work, being an illustrator, and especially with uh, a lot of illustration in-house jobs, um, they, they're just not—they're just not available like in other professions. You know, yeah. um, when I got out of school, a lot of companies were phasing those out in favor of hiring freelancers because then they don't have to pay for you know four hundred one or put money into four hundred one ks or healthcare or anything like that. So, uh, and then you're in this art world where everybody, a bunch of people want things for free and uh, stuff like that. So it's, it's a, it's a hard, it's, it's a hard, um, I guess it, it's just a hard profession or it can be, you know, sometimes it's not, sometimes, sometimes it's really hard, but then you put on top of this, the cost of school. And especially if you go to an art school, which is generally going to be a private school and pay, a, you know, you have to pay an even higher amount 
than say if you go to a state school or something like that. And so, um, and you're not going to get health care if you don't get an in-house job and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and people don't want to pay a lot, a lot of times, uh, especially when you're starting out. And so the reason why now I've sort of changed on art school, like in the past, you're, talk, you're talking like, you know, when I was on Big Illustration Party Time or the Art and Story podcast and kind of weighing out pros and cons. And I still, back then, I still weighed on the side of pro art school. And now I'm pro not going to art school and doing your due diligence like you do, Marsh, like, you know, learning through... Uh, you know, podcasts or YouTube videos or books or, you know, any number of the things that are available now that right. um, now the, the drawback there is um, if you are alone and doing, you know, doing this by yourself, one of the big benefits of going to art school is having a peer group that, you know, and, and uh, you know, your teachers in art school are pros. And so then you, and you get, feedback from your peer group and your pro and professionals. So that's why now it's, it's uh, important, I think, to develop a community of, of peers and, you know, some pros that you can talk to, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, things like that. So you can get that kind of feedback, but a lot of the learning you don't need to be spending, you know, you don't need to go a hundred thousand dollars in debt, mm. you know, and uh, it's like when, I have to pay my student loan every month. I just look at it like this is never going away for the rest of my life, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I mean that sounds negative because somehow, some way, I'll get rid of it. But um, it's such a big amount of money that it it seems comically fake. You know, like <laughs> wait, how, how much still? <laughs> I've been out of art school since two thousand five. What? <laughs> you know, yeah, I can't um, imagine. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons, but right now, financially, in today's world, with the things that are available, Skillshare, for example, um, I think it's like a hundred bucks or something a year, or, or maybe it's more. I can't remember. It's 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 some something like maybe ten a month, so 120 a year, something like that. I don't know. You know, there's, there's tons of stuff like that now. It's right. way cheaper than going to art school. So, um, but, yeah. So so I guess I'm saying it's mostly financially. But sometimes you need that push. And if you can afford it, you know, it might be the way to go. But Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure I, I like, half the people are cheering and the other half the people are like, shut up. <laughs> Idiot. Uh yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's a tough decision. Um, I, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm pretty much where you're at, the same, same situation. I'm, you know, as far as just my opinion on it, it, it can be good and it, it can be not so great. So, But speaking about um, doing things yourself, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about... Uh, See, the thing is, I don't even know exactly where to start, but um, I don't, I think, I don't know how long, like if, like my memory is not exact, but um, I think it, there was a Art and Story episode or maybe a couple episodes where, and it might have been a different podcast, I can't remember, but there was something where you dedicated like a show to talking about like how punk rock influences like art and and like um just kind of the the um almost like the principles of like punk rock and stuff and especially like on the do-it-yourself type of stuff and that was like a big like eye-opening kind of thing for me i didn't really i mean i sort of knew it about punk rock but i didn't know it a lot a lot about it mm -hmm. um i had witnessed my friends a, a few of my friends um kind of doing it when I was in high school and um, I was pretty amazed that they like they were pressing up like 45s and stuff and making their own like little um, uh, like like the inserts and all that stuff and and I was just like this is so cool but I was like so 
in into hip hop at that point that I, I didn't go much further than that. But I just remember thinking it was so cool that they were doing all that. And um, and yeah, I don't know. And then when I heard you talk about that, that that's like kind of really part of the ethos of um, of what punk rock kind of is or, or what it kind of became. It, it was even more exciting to me. And and I've definitely used that kind of thinking um, moving forward with, with comic books. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to ask, but I, I guess I'd, I'd be curious to know like a little bit about like what it was like. I've heard, you know, your, your kind of origin story, you know, with um, punk rock before, but I, I'd be curious mm -hmm. to know a little bit about what it what the scene was like um that you kind of grew up in as far as you know punk rock goes and and when you first like started kind of working doing you know band stuff and, and all that stuff like i know you um kind of from the bay area correct yeah but actually like, my family had moved to texas for a little bit in the 80s from the bay um uh, a lot of families at the time, like I had a lot of friends from all over the country living there. I lived in this little suburb outside of Houston at the time. Um, and a lot of families had moved for work. There was a lot of work there at the time. So, um, so that's actually where I got into punk rock, um, was in Texas. And then a couple of years into it, my family moved back to the Bay and, uh, you know, and that's when I really started, really hitting it with playing band in bands and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, getting a little bit more involved. It was a little bit bigger in California than it was in by a little bit. I mean, it was a lot, <laughs> it was still small. It was still small. I got to say, cause back then, you know, it was just, it, it was just very small, but in Texas it was minuscule. So, and I, I hate to date you, but I'm I am curious like what what was the uh, time the to, to, the years that you were kind of originally like the this kind of time period? What were the years? Uh, 1983, 1984. Okay, first got into it. Uh, previous to that, I was <clears throat> I was really into metal, um, mm -hmm. Iron Maiden, Jews Priest, uh, a lot of the thrash stuff at first you know, it was first kind of coming out like early Metallica and Slayer and Anthrax and um, some of the early black metal or stuff that would ultimately end up influencing black metal like Venom, bands like that. And what I didn't realize at the time because punk rock was so small that um, that kind of metal was influenced by punk rock mm. too. You know, so, so it was kind of like... Um, that kind of bridges gap for me. And, and then I would also go, this is also the time I remember going to see, let's say Iron Maiden, something like that. So it was one of the, one of the bigger, bigger metal bands at the time. And uh, in the parking lot, you know, I'm this kid and you've got these like, just wasteoid people who, you know, they're, they're probably just a couple years older than me, but when you're that young, you know, everybody looks like they're 30 mm -hmm. and, uh, just yelling at you, I made it, made it, and stuff like that. And I was like, it's like, yeah, I love him too, but you're acting like a, you're acting <laughs> like a buffoon, <laughs> you know? Nice. And uh, I mean, there, there's a bunch of other other reasons, you know? I mean, I still love all that stuff too, to this day. I love Iron Maiden still, but, um, but anyway, uh, metal was kind of, uh, kind of, kind of a popular thing, you know, even though, even though talking about Slayer and stuff like that, yeah, there's the underground that was good and I gravitate more towards that. But, you know, this is also the era where like, like the kind of hair, you know, butt rock hair metal was dominating MTV and things like that. And so I, I don't know if I was just getting disillusioned by, by everything at a young age and, mm. you know, or at, or at that age, or if it was just, you know, it was time for a change because I was, an angsty kid, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting. Like I didn't realize I was, I wasn't quite sure about the time period um, for you, but like you, you were really um, starting to get into it. Like really right in the early stages of punk rock. Um, you know, well, I mean, the early stages of like American hardcore. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I was I was real young, and the first bands that I really gravitated towards were um, mostly West Coast hardcore, which is, you know, I know a lot of people in New York want to disagree, but hey, that's where it started. TSOL <laughs> and Black Flag and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, I was really, Circle Jerks, I was really into those bands. And, uh, you know, those guys were... Sorry, you kind of you kind of uh, flipped out there. What what bands? <laughs> oh, uh, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, TSOL. Uh, just I could I could go on and on. Um, and so I started listening to that, and then you know I was in Texas, which is in the middle of the country, obviously, mm-hmm. south of you know central south, whatever. Um, and at the time, oh, that's what I was saying, punk rock. So I'm at the beginning of the hardcore. Mm-hmm. era of punk rock um history books rock and roll history books kind of their official date is 1981 but uh there there was bands that were playing like that you know real fast versions of punk rock which get renamed hardcore later uh before that you know i think every music music movement it gets its name and then people think oh well like like punk rock started in 1976 but then the Ramones came up, started in 1974. So do we say that was that you know? And then in the 60s there was these garage rock bands that really sound like punk bands, you know. So it's you know. Anyway, I think every movement actually starts a decade before people name it, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, I mean, you can say that was like rock and roll before rock and roll in the 1940s. It was called rhythm and blues, and now R&B and rock and roll sound completely different, you know. Right. Like they've separated. It's, I don't know. I could talk about this stuff forever and <laughs> go on all the tangents. And I'm trying to stop myself from it because I love talking about rock and roll history and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. anyway, so yeah, so you know, it was like '83. I started hearing it. '84. I'm like really into it. So you know, if the official historical date is '81, um, then uh, you know. I'm, Kind of in the beginning, but it also kind of ended. It also kind of fizzled out real fast. Like, like the the initial run of hardcore before it started splintering into different kind of groups. You know, and like now hardcore is a different genre than hardcore punk. You know, and all this kind of stuff. And it's 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 such a, like a fine line too. It's it's kind of silly to talk like that, but but I guess that's progress. <laughs> and uh, so. You know, I was I was uh, got pretty hard and heavy into it, and uh, you know, by the time I was out of high school, that that generation of hardcore was kind of dead, and you know, so it wasn't wasn't a very long time. But man, it was exciting because it was brand new, and you could do no wrong. There wasn't like a uniform quite yet, um, mm-hmm. which was nice. You could, you know, it was like really freeing and. People of all walks of life were part of it. Whereas now, depending on where you are, you know, you go to a show and it's just like a bunch of white dudes, or you know, um, it, it was just like if you felt like you didn't, there was something about whatever was going on in your life, um, you know, your situation. You know, you might live in the suburbs and just be a bored kid. And the rock and roll that we were getting was this garbagey pop stuff on MTV and uh, bands like, you know, Poison and just, you know, just, I don't know. It's just like we thought there was something better. And then you hear this punk rock, which is kind of a, a going back to uh, basic rock and roll, but playing it snottier, louder, and faster. And for an angsty kid, that was real appealing. So... So I got into it, and whenever I get into something, um, and I've said this a bunch on podcasts, on my YouTube channel and stuff, that uh, I find it hard to just be a spectator. I want to be a participant, you know? Mm-hmm. So got a guitar and started. I think I was in my first band within three months of having a guitar. <laughs> and it's not because we were good at it. It's because punk rock said, you want to do something, go do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If there's not an avenue set out for you to go do that thing you want to do, you make the avenue. <laughs> you know, you pave the trail yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. 
and there's a lot of that still in punk rock. Unfortunately, as it's gotten gotten older and stuff, you know, there's there's kind of a lot of rules to it now, and I don't agree with them at all. And you know, a lot of what a I don't know, kind of an established uniform, and I'm like, ah, oh, that doesn't seem punk. You did, oh, you're doing it wrong now. But saying you're doing it wrong is not punk either. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. You know, it's <laughs> funny because as I'm like, I'm, I'm getting, getting feedback, feedback again here. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm speaking just stuff. All right. How's All that? Right. Uh, still, oh, I think it's gone. Okay, cool. Okay. So I was going to say, like, um, as like I've been doing like a lot of researching into kind of the punk stuff and whatnot and um, just trying to just learn about the history and all that and, and learn about different bands and whatnot. And, um, and one thing, like, as I'm learning about it, I'm like, I almost feel like punk rock in some ways almost has nothing to do with like the the typical music you would think punk rock is <laughs> like it could have nothing to do with it it does but it like i feel like i don't know like the the essence of what it is kind of you can i almost feel like i could put out a rap, a rap album and it would be punk rock <laughs> like i could call it punk rock if it had the right like just that attitude of like i don't care i'm doing everything myself i'm you know i kind of I don't know. I just feel like that there's a way like, like just like you were saying, like not letting kind of anything stop you using the resources you have, make something and kind of there's something about like the raw energy of like being like, all right, everything that's been stopping me, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do it. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There's something about that attitude that to me is like, almost even if you didn't make what sounds like punk rock it still could be almost punk rock like i don't know does that make any sense <laughs> it totally does there's um uh, i mean there's a bunch of ways i can kind of go with this um and, and i think I've, I've mentioned this to you before is that you know on I, I think i mentioned it already today um <laughs> that that the rise of hip hop and punk rock were so um, kind of about the same time, you know, like 70s New York, you know, you've got like Sugar Hill Gang and then you've got Richard Hell and the Boy Doids. And this is like, these are these new, the, you know, the, kind of these new predominantly youth movements, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now granted, I think when it first started, most of the bands in, in um, whether you're talking punk or, or hip, hip hop, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're probably like in their twenties, late teens, or something like that. By the time hip hop hit my my age group, which were like the teens of the eighties, it had gotten younger. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like LL Cool J. I remember he was big at the time. He was young, like super young. Uh, Beastie Boys. You know, they started hardcore punk. You know. Mm -hmm. We know where they went, <laughs> you know, and yeah. uh, just and, and they were young, you know, uh, when they were doing hard the hardcore stuff. I want to say that they were like fifteen to sixteen years old in eighty one, um, and then I think Ad Rock was even younger, and he was in a different band before he joined Beastie Boys. That was a hardcore band called Young and the Useless. Mm -hmm. um, but but anyway, so there's so many like like parallels with with hip hop stuff coming up and I was just thinking like the DIY thing that was so part of punk rock and, and still is to a large extent. Um, you know, I think of uh, seeing this stuff at the time because part of, part of punk rock was we were kind of like, Oh, there's no rules. So um, we were into hip hop too. We just looked like, you know, we had, bright blue hair and you know stuff like that instead of like a adidas tracksuit for example you know um because it seemed like the the uniforms were being established at that point kind of or being invented or you know whatever right and uh and i think of you know there's especially in the world of hip-hop there's nothing more punk rock than 
the dude who's selling his tapes out of the trunk of his car, which was a big right. hip hop thing, right? Yep. It's punk rock. Um, the the music that we were playing, that I was playing, um, at the time, you know, the the rock and roll club down the street was going to be twenty one and over. We were too young to, you know, so they wouldn't let us in. Plus, they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear. They wanted to hear like Leonard Skinner cover bands and stuff like that. And there was this um, uh, stereotype about punks being very violent. And yes, there was violence in the scene, but uh, I think it's like it's sensa- It's it's been way more sensationalized than it really was, um, for one thing. And and so you know, places wouldn't let us put on shows, so we had to go to like we had to like trick vets halls and. Um, uh, play basement shows and um, sometimes get a generator and go to like an abandoned building or something, you know? And yeah, that's yeah. actually reminds me of like, um, like the early uh, park jams of hip hop. Like they would literally, that's what I'm saying. Systems to the, like the, the street lights and stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. And, and so is it, is hip hop and punk rock, are they different? or do they just have different instruments? Like one's got, you know, okay. DJ table, one's got, one's got a guitar, you know what I mean? And then, um, so there's yeah, a lot even of, pro- the fact that they were scratching on DJ on, on turntables, like that's a whole different, like they made up an instrument like that to yeah. me. That's punk rock. <laughs> punk yeah. Rock, so, you know? <laughs> you know, that, that's that they come from the same, the same, it's like come from the same cloth as far as attitude and, and all that goes. You know, mm-hmm. and so, you know, I remember by the time the '90s came around, it was um, you start seeing a real division, um, and I think it was because the kids who were a little bit younger than me were now in high school or something like that, and they were looking at us and doing it a little bit different. And when you're that young, you know, you always got to do something different than the people who were there before you, you know. Right. And uh, even though they were still in the, at that point, still in my same generation, they weren't fighting the generation. But um, and and sometimes you know they would see things and and uh, get the wrong idea. Like you know, back in my day, we'd go in the pit. We never said mosh pit. That sounded like a poser, like a poser word to us for some reason. Like oh, you don't know anything. You're not from our scene. You say mosh pit, and then that became the normal vernacular. Um, we used to call it slamming. We never said moshing until like it was a little bit later. And even even now, uh, suicidal tendencies. You know, old old Venice Beach band. Um, they have a song we don't slam or we don't mosh, we slam. You know, and they've been around for I mean probably forty years now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, but you know it looked violent. But it really wasn't. Um, it looked like spastic and crazy, but there was a rhythm to it. And and then you know, younger people get in it and they see it and they just and that's why you go there and people just throwing punches, going backwards in it and hurting people and stuff and it's garbage. Yeah, um, I was um, checking out a documentary um, about one of the famous clubs in Southern California. Um, you, I'm sure you know it right off the tip of your tongue. <laughs> um, well, there's a few. It, Cuckoo's Nest. Cook, I think it was Cuckoo's Nest, yeah. And I think I know what your documentary might be talking about. And they were talking about, like, the whole, you know, s- slamming mosh pit type thing. And, and it, that that interest, that was interesting to me because it's like, yeah, like you said, like, the, the punk rock stuff, like, it, it seems like it's violent. Even just the the clothes that kind of became popular with it or whatever they it seems like it's violent but it seemed like like from the get-go in those early times it was really just kids blowing off some steam and i mean there probably was plenty of like fights and whatnot but it wasn't like yeah like crazy and, and then they even mentioned like it, it started to get too crazy and that was kind of when certain kind of people came in like more like the jock type of people came in and just wanted to be violent and stuff yeah and it changed <laughs> yeah and usually those type of people start would gravitate towards um kind of being your more violent skinhead types right too and so then there was a lot of fights when skinheads start really showing up 
<laughs> yeah, because I mean, once that that's that's always like a weird thing to me because there is that like stereotype of like the skinhead like punk rocker type person, but it's like I never thought of it until recently where I'm like, wait a minute, like isn't skinheads like totally different, like a whole different set of ideas and beliefs than what punk rock stands for? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of varieties of skinheads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your most popular, of course, are going to be your Nazis. <laughs> right. but th that's that's the most popular stereotype in everyone's head. They're actually just they're probably um, a minority in the skinhead world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they're just garbage people, of course. And uh, and we used to call them boneheads back in the day to differentiate them from skinheads. Because there's all, all these different varieties, like you've got suede heads and um, it, I'm stopping myself because I could go on forever. The <laughs> second, the second, it, at least as far as in the U.S. goes, I'm sure other you know Western countries, same thing. The second popular group of skinheads are called Sharps, mm -hmm. and Sharps it, Sharp stands for Skinheads Against Racial Preju Prejudice. Mm. which is kind of an answer to Nazis being like, Hey, you know, we're, we're working class. That's, that's what most skinhead stuff touts. We're working class. Um, and, uh, but we want unity and all this kind of stuff like that. But the problem with that, some of the, the different skinhead groups is if the Nazi skinheads are there, they're on your side and then we'll fight the Nazis. If there's no Nazis there, they still want to fight somebody. And who's there? You are. You know, and um, and there's this, you know, you hear like, well, it's just boys being boys. And it's like, no, your boys ruin a fucking show, <laughs> you know, like right. chill out, <laughs> be cool. Um, so there's that there's but the funny thing, it's always been not funny, haha, -ha, but interesting to me is that the skinhead movement started in Jamaica. <laughs> and so right. how the boneheads can go from from that point and uh, decide that we're going to call ourselves skinheads too, but hate black people and yet play a really stripped down type of rock and roll punk rock called Oi. It's still rock and roll. Black people invented rock and roll. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't get it. What are you doing? <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, there you know, you don't see. There's not a lot of lot of skinhead fights at punk shows anymore. Also, I don't go to punk shows as many much anymore because I'm a dad now and I'm old. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I don't know. That's a that's a rambly, very very brief talk of skinheads because there's just yeah, there's there's a, a big variety yeah. of, of groups and well, in every every sub culture now too so mm -hmm. cool but yeah they were there start fights i was a i was a mohawk guy so yeah sometimes they they like me and if they're boneheads they always hated me just that was, <laughs> yeah no doubt um that was something that was that i did always notice you know about like the punk stuff was i was like i, I did kind of think well all right, um, you know they they're talking about like nonconformity and all that kind of stuff, and and then I'm like, but wait a minute, like they all have this kind of look to them, you know, or whatever that they kind of go for. But what I'm realizing as I'm researching it is, you know, in the beginning that was just people kind of like expressing themselves the way they wanted to, and and eventually it kind of almost accidentally became a look, and then it's almost like the people who kind of coming after that who have that look it's like okay now these guys they're not really necessarily the authentic ones they're like kind of what you guys probably would call posers or whatever and 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 it's just it's just funny like i i didn't realize like the more i i kind of research it the more i'm just like it's such an awesome movement and i wish like I, I almost wish like i was able to be a part of it but you know it just grew up in a different time but um i don't know it's just, it's just a lot of interesting stuff 
What's that? Never too late. Or too late, yeah. Part of it. I mean, you've been doing hip hop stuff for a long time, and uh, you know, that's uh, I feel like they're hip hop and, and punk rock are kind of kissing cousins. Oh, yeah, there's there's so many like similarities, and and you hear it too, and in, in some of the documentaries, people talking about that, and and it's interesting, but there's definitely you know some differences too, and I mean, hip hop, yeah. you know. They, they were kind of more comfortable and more interested in like and happy to kind of go commercial whereas punk rock like what would probably be you know more on the like uh pure side of punk rock would you know kind of be totally against that it seems like i mean hip-hop there's there's that too actually there's people who don't want to go commercial but um i don't know in general you know that they, they tend to be more commercial friendly or whatever Mm -hmm. um, one thing I was really actually surprised about as I'm kind of looking into it is I always thought of punk rock as very political. Um, and yeah. what I found out is that, yes, there's obviously that, um, and that's a big part of it, but there's also a lot of punk rock that's just not anywhere. It's not political. It's just either having fun or just, I don't know, different talking about all different kind of things too. So I, don't know, I was yeah. kind of surprised to see that. Yeah, it's it's um uh I think first and foremost, uh and I, I feel like I'm getting this from a documentary that I saw. Um and it's always it, it's always resonated with me because it's something that um was kind of where me and my friends who were you know when we were these little young punks were kind of coming from so in the 70s um you know i, I think it might be in uh, end of the century the documentary about the ramones mm -hmm. um I, I could be wrong i haven't seen it for a long time but um anyway uh basically the point being is some old you know original american punk was kind of saying what what it meant what it meant to him and his friends at the time or whatever and uh rock and roll had become very very bloated very commercial very arena rock mm -hmm. and you start getting bands like yes and um yeah where's some of the others uh, edgar winters jr and just these huge arenas and and these like um, just bloated like eight minute long songs that are really pretentious with like 10,000 solos from all the people in the band and and uh, you know it, it just gone to this point of excess and uh, it just it, it was no longer like music for the people by the people <laughs> in a sense you know it was like rock rock stars were golden gods on these big pedestals right and uh, and then you had these kids in the 70s were like, well, that's no fair. My parents got to listen to Little Richard and Chuck Berry and stuff like that. And the kinks and, you know, stuff. And these, like, these, like, quick, like, three-chord, just kind of primitive songs, you know, that, that just, like, really get you. And uh, And now I've got to listen to these, like, you know, these, these rich guys up there playing an eight minute long song where, you know, it just rambles on and on. It's like, look at how many notes I can play and all this. And they're like, no, 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 no. Um, and you know, at some point in my life, I, I came to this, this point that real rock and roll needs to be sexy and dangerous, hopefully both. And those bloated bands had neither. And, um, you know, and that's what the original rockers had. It was all sexy and dangerous. And rock and roll um, should, I think, should mostly not come from your head. It should mostly come from your heart and your crotch. And so, you know, that wasn't happening at the time. You know, sure, you had some standouts like Black Sabbath and stuff like that. But um, uh, so really, the original punks were like, we want rock and roll back. Here's what it is. So... Sure, there's going to be politics in it. There's politics in rock and roll, you know, at the time. I mean, look at the 60s. There's a bunch of protest songs and everything. And then there's songs about how you got dumped. And there's songs about, you know. So it's just really, it's just it's just rock and roll, you know. 
but you do have bands that are like violently political and I, I don't mean violent as in um maybe vehemently is the better word for it you know mm-hmm. Maybe violence is a good word too, though, because the nature of the music is very aggressive and the imagery is very violent sometimes for bands like that. But um, yeah, some bands picked you know picked that to do, and then other bands just wanted to talk about skateboarding and drinking beer, you know. <laughs> so you know, it, it's just if you look at it that way, you know, it's just it's just a di- it's just rock and roll, <laughs> you know, really. Okay. Um, to some people, it doesn't sound like it. Some people, like, you know, um, my dad used to think it sounded like static, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. but it's just rock and roll. I think a, a big part of what makes punk rock awesome, too, is a huge part of it is how inclusive it is. And and I, I think, um, you know, it became that even, like, as it went, um but I don't know, like, I don't know. I just think it's it's really cool. Like, I think right at the core of it, though, like you're saying, like, there's all these, like, rock bands who are, like, and I'll, all honestly, they were becoming, like, amazing musicians, you know, but they weren't yeah. necessarily, they didn't really have, like, that, that, like, maybe that hunger and that passion anymore, um, you know, and there's a lot of bands like that that I really enjoy as, like, maybe artists or, or but but then you got like punk rock and it's like if that was the music that you know say i was like really into rock and roll or whatever and that was the music i heard i would feel like oh well it's it's unapproachable like i'll never be able to do that like but then punk rock is just like and, and it it's funny because it started with those same bands because you know the early stuff like you know i guess um what would be like mc5 and like the stooges and stuff like that like it almost it's it still had kind of that hippie feel to it to a certain extent, but but they were just yeah, starting like, to be like they were like no. yeah they were starting to be like screw it like I'm sick of this this and this and I'm just gonna rock out and there's there's a lot of people who actually do that who maybe aren't even necessarily punk rock like there's one group um, one dude that I I don't know what your opinion of this guy is but to me like he kind of especially when he first started was like. Um, he's definitely was like breaking out he's just like screw it i'm just gonna do it the way i can which i think of um that dude jack white who's in the yeah. white stripes or whatever yeah like, it's like, I like the early white stripes records yeah yeah and it's just like you know it's like I, i'm just like he found out like the most minimalist way that he could make an album and then got like a a, f- a lady to do the drums who didn't even know how to play drums and he made it work and it was it, it has that energy you know it has that like screw it i'm just gonna do it and just gonna make it happen <laughs> you know type of thing yeah. and there's something to that you know that i just love you know <laughs> yeah totally um yeah i mean the white stripes in the beginning were um kind of in this garage rock scene which you know if i can go on if i go on one of my tangents i can tell you how garage rock started punk rock and the mod scene Mm -hmm. you know that was like the mods in the 60s and the garage rockers in america like like i've got a whole like uh (laughs) i haven't heard a lot of other people talk about talk about it in terms like this but i have this whole theory where so okay i'm going i'm doing it i'm going there okay (laughs) Um, so, so you get, uh, you, you got a bunch of uh, black people in America, they're playing, um, R and B, which simply just got renamed rock and roll. So it could be repackaged for, for white kids, you know, essentially is what, what it jump goes down to. But, um, like there's a, the guy who I guess named it was Alan Freed he was a big big DJ at the time and he was playing a lot of a lot of these R&B records he's a lot of Fats Domino and Little Richard that kind of stuff kind of renamed it uh you know white kids went nuts and uh he's doing this interview you find it on YouTube and I'm going to paraphrase here but Alan Freed goes up to Fats Domino he says hey what do you think about this new rock and roll thing and Fats Domino is very polite he looks at him he's playing his piano and he looks down at him he goes um I like this rock and roll thing quite, 
you know, fine. I've been playing it since 1942. I love it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the interview took place in 1954 or something like that, you know? Um, and so, so anyway, rock and roll becomes the youth cultural phenomena that it is at the time. Uh, over in Europe, especially the UK, they start hearing rock and roll and you start getting these, you know, these kids who are starting to get into American blues and R&B and what's now rock, American rock and roll. And they start bands, Rolling Stones, the Beatles, you know, those bands, mm -hmm. um, which then ends up kind of this mod scene kind of sprouts out, you know, out of that. Cause at the time there's these, um, the early mods were more jazz guys, but uh, you know, we're talking the fifties. So like kind of the cool people then were more into jazz over there, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were the modernists and uh, they got shorted down, shortened to mod after that. And, you know, uh, and get the who and the small faces and the eyes and the easy or easy beats were they from yeah they're from over there um, and uh, and it's all kind of influenced by this American predominantly black generated music and um, and they do their spin on it and and it's like they almost did it they did it wrong in a way that created something good because it created something new you know. Mm -hmm. And you get the mod movement, and this is where I say that it's kind of this is all my theories. These are all, all my theories, so I could be totally wrong. But this is this is me looking at history books and and not seeing some of the threads connected like this. I guess mm -hmm. um, is so. Then I really think that kind of the mod scene is becomes sort of the template for um, what would later be punk. Here's why: is because it was really the first. Um, po like popular music scene with a subculture that was created by the youth, played by the youth, um, had a fashion that was directed by the youth. The youth was all in control. It was, it was youth doing stuff for youth, which was very punk back in the day. Now a lot of us are all in our forties and gray on their in their beards, and we can't grow mohawks anymore because there's no hair there. But um, <clears throat> but back then it was that was a thing, and so. So then we get, you know, the, the British invasion and, uh, you know, the Beatles and the Stones obviously are the forefront of that. But, you know, we start, kids in America start listening to those bands and they start listening to the Kinks and the Who and um, some of the, you know, all these other bands I, I mentioned. Well, that develops a sort of this kind of garage rock sound. Um, and now you've got these kids who were even just a little bit younger than these kids because those bands were kids at the time essentially um you know i mean they might be in their early 20s by the time that we're getting them or whatever they're they're young super young so you get teenagers over here they love those bands they start picking up guitars and drums and start kind of these little cover bands start emulating them um i mean meanwhile like we had you know uh, like Dick Dale and the Beach Boys was, you know, that whole surf sound was kind of becoming a new thing too. And, and so, <clears throat> so there's, there's elements of that mixed in with this, this uh, British invasion stuff. And, um, and then it's like, they kind of did a little bit wrong too. And then it created a new sound. And then that's where American punk rock starts being born to me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, it's like youth, the youth movement for the youth by the youth. And, uh, and then like these rock and roll bands, um, eventually grow up and they start becoming, you know, uh, like you said, a little, there's a little less heart. There's more pretension because they're trying to play all the notes and show how great they are. And they're trying to, Oh, you know, I'm so, I'm so smart. I'm a musician. So I'm smarter than everybody. So I will do a concept record now and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When kids just want to fuck shit up, <laughs> have fun, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, so to me, that is, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Curious to see the comments. If anyone comes, like, you're totally wrong, dummy. But, um, <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, kind of the, the beginning of punk for me going all the way back. Um, you know, to, to sort of 
I guess the R and B, but um, I guess I'm kind of done with that thought. I think I was trying to tie it into something else, but I tangented for too long. <laughs> um, no, nope, that was kind of a funny story. I was in this band, and for some reason, one of our records was doing better in the UK and Italy than anywhere else, and um, so this this uh, Italian music magazine sent this guy and his girlfriend who was a photographer over to the US to, to sort of live with us for um, I would say it was like five days four or five days mm -hmm. and follow us around interview us and stuff like that we ended up taking them to this bar one night and uh, and it's it's early 2000s I think at the time and so at that point there's like punk pop punk hardcore punk 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 rock and roll there's all these like you know sub genres of punk now and stuff and so this guy's younger and he asks you know well what kind of what kind of punk rock do you play well i had a couple of drinks i was feeling a little loose <laughs> and so i got out a sharpie and there's a stack of napkins and i sort of fold out these napkins and start and i start talking about like where my band was at the time what we were influenced by so there's like the spider web spreading out what and then i started talking about what those bands were influenced by what the, those bands are influenced by and it goes all the way down eventually robert johnson probably know the famous story of him at the crossroads sold sort of devil um that that whole uh you know it's it's just like kind of a, a rad american uh urban legend now you know mm -hmm. go to the crossroads sell your soul and you become the best musician in the world that kind of thing that starts with Robert Johnson, old Delta Blues guy in the twenties, and so I eventually got down to Robert Johnson and like Lead Belly and and all these you know early blues guys, and I was like, so, well, I guess we don't play punk rock, we're a blues band. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I guess it, maybe it's just going back to my point, just all rock and roll, and um, yeah. it's great. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, and the, that's kind of the vibe. I, that's kind of the thing I, I get from um, when I hear, like, some of the, you know, kind of originators talk about it and stuff. And um, and I, I did want to also kind of get a little bit into, like, you know, kind of with this. I, I feel like, like, all right, this is my, my little – if I had anything to say of what I would like to see from you and your channel and things like that, <laughs> I would love to hear you. Like, I would love to see you just like either draw in your sketchbook or whatever the random thing you happen to be drawing and just like each video, just do a story from back in the day. Cause I know you have like a million stories probably from the road and whatnot. And just talk about a, sto a story from, when you were rocking out and doing your thing, you know, back then. And like that to me would be like super fun. Like I'd watch every video and be like super excited. <laughs> um, yeah, that's something. Um, that's something I would like to do. My mom watches my YouTube channel though. So sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's funny. So there's definitely stories I'll tell in public and in private <laughs> that are different. <laughs> and unfortunately, some of the best ones are, are the ones that people only get to hear in private. But, um, right. uh, yeah, you know, there, there was, I don't know, I love talking about this stuff. You know, even even my, my harebrained theories about the history of rock and roll and things like that. And it's, uh, I don't know, man, it's just fun to talk about. <laughs> you know, I don't care if I'm wrong. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I, I have the same thing. I get really like kind of geeky and nerdy sometimes about even just lyricism and hip hop and stuff like that and, and just different different topics and stuff. Um and I same really with punk as I'm I'm getting more into it. Yeah, um, you know, if you um I mean we don't have to do it right right the second, but you know, since we're we're doing this show here, but um you know, if, if there's any any bands you want me to steer you towards or if you tell me punk that you find that you like and maybe I can kind of send you down a path of bands that that I think based based on that you know that you'll like and stuff I'd love to do that you know 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I just like briefly, I'll just talk about some of the stuff I've been checking out. But I do want to get to another little bit of a topic before we um, close it out. Um, but just some of the stuff I've been really digging as I as I research is like, um, well, first of all, your music is really cool. Like I love, first of all, probably my favorite of what you did is literally Barbarian Riot Squad. Like that stuff is, <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. Like that album or EP. Um, and then I also I like the um, the Very first cool. album of um, yeah no problem of uh, Pitch Black like that's that's like an interesting kind of thing. Um, and then so like more I really, oh yeah, and I really love like Nerve Agents like yeah. So you like the dress every, stuff, so. almost everything I heard on Nerve Agent stuff is like yeah that's I dig that <laughs> and like yeah I like stuff that sounds like like i'm more into stuff that's less polished and more like it sounds like like literally a few guys picked up a guitar and and started making something and so that's, like that's what i like too i feel like the polished stuff somehow when it's too polished the the song or record or whatever could have come from a place with a lot of heart and soul and somehow production can really kill that yeah yeah, yeah. and so like some of the bands um that I've been really digging is um like I really love that uh the um the germs I, I don't know if it seems like they only did one album I don't know but I love that album um I love um agnostic um front, agnostic front. like that um that oh, dude was, you would have been like we would you would have been in my group of friends had you been younger <laughs> and, and you know where I was living because that's yeah so you like you like okay you like some good shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I always go when I hear this stuff, like I, I always go to their first album. So like I yeah. then had like an EP, I guess. And like literally like, I don't know, like seven of the songs were like 26 seconds long or something. And I was just like, I don't know, like I'm like, holy crap, like that's crazy. And I just love them. Like those songs are like nuts. And then um, the uh, this one I actually got from like looking at your timeline on instagram um but uh the adolescents they're really cool yeah um what else there's there's so many um that i i've been digging on but yeah that kind of stuff like i feel like and, and i also like the really classic stuff too like the pre-punk stuff and um like some of the early stuff early punk stuff but like i feel like the the real crux of it is kind of in um kind of the the california stuff the the hardcore punk stuff that it feels like that's sort of what i'm into although like dead kennedys and um and black flag like i really dig them but i feel like i like the people who came a little bit before that sometimes well even more <laughs> those bands actually um, Black Flag and Dead Kennedys are two of my very favorites. I mean, I have a Black Flag tattoo on my arm. It's big, you know. Um, they actually started in the 70s, those two bands. So, um, yeah, no, I, I definitely dig dig them. Um, and it's just, I, I just, I know that, like, like the adolescents and the germs, like, <laughs> those, those are some of my favorite. Um, like, I just love the, the, rawness of it and um and i'm so like, both surprised and delighted that you love the germs because that's and so then good i'm also kind of curious about um what you think of the band um crass like they're a weird band but some of their stuff is really cool <laughs> um you know what they might be new <laughs> okay <laughs> oh, <man. coughs> That's awesome. Um, so as someone who's like just exploring this stuff for yourself now, and, and that's your take on them, that is the take of every punk, that every punk's take on them as well. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Crass, but yeah, they're, they're, they're more like this weird movement than a, than a band in a way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like some of the records, it's just a lot of like, noises and someone yelling weird political poetry at you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of 
artsy. Um, oh yeah, I mean, it's totally the easy. stuff that rocks really rocks. I don't know, like it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's there's um uh, a couple like short documentaries on YouTube about. Um, I think you'll dig these too. The uh, the making of the Crass logo, and then there's another one, the making of the Black Flag logo, and then I can't remember the third band they did, but it, it's 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 like art and punk together, and he's you can just YouTube. Yeah, you know, making the crafts logo or something, and they'll, they'll pop yeah, up. Yeah, I think I saw those. The the uh, some different like art of stuff, and um, those are really interesting too. Um, I'll be honest; it's getting a little late here for me. <laughs> cool. um, I really did want to get into um, just kind of how it like relates to like art and comics and stuff, uh, but I think I actually have to get going here um i feel like we could probably talk about this stuff forever <laughs> and get into yeah. all kinds of crazy corners yeah, and totally. whatnot <laughs> um but yeah man it's it's been fun chatting with you about this and um yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah dude, for sure i mean even if uh, we don't do it on another podcast we just uh you know, when we're working in, in you know by ourselves just throw on Skype or hang out or something. We can talk about this while we're working. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would definitely think that would be fun. So um, so I will say for everybody listening, and I haven't peeked at the chat because I actually closed everything out because I was feeling like my computer was going to explode. But um, uh, I did see that Jeff and um, – and my buddy Fue were in the chat earlier, but thanks everybody who has been um, watching live and also those who watch on the replay. Um, and uh, I, I actually did put um, Kevin's YouTube link and his website link already in, in the description, so you can definitely check that out. Where can they um, find you on uh, social media? Um. Probably the best now is is actually, uh, pro well, probably YouTube is the best, but um, I don't really do Facebook so much anymore, so uh, probably just Kevin Cross mm -hmm. on Twitter and Instagram. Um, cool. Been pretty quiet on social media, though, this summer. But, yeah. But that'll change. I need a break. <laughs> but, yeah, pretty much, yeah, just Kevin Cross, Twitter. Instagram, come across art on YouTube. Cool, cool. Or Monkey Mod Comic. It's got like two names, but whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, just keep, uh, we'll, we'll all keep our eyes and ears peeled for, for uh, the Monkey Mod Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. When that, when that comes about, I'm sure I'm it's. Looking forward to it coming, <laughs> to that happening sooner and later. Can't wait to have it in my hands, but it's been awesome seeing the process and stuff too. Um, right but yeah, man. Um, yeah, again, I wish we could uh, just keep chatting forever, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, we do have to get going. Um, but thanks again for having me on, um, everybody. This is this is the final Skate Artist Podcast, so thank you for being part of the ride. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting for this. Um this, this monumental achievement. Yes. And it's the hundredth. So it's like, it's like the guy who created the hundred days of making comics on the hundred. <laughs> um, it's always rad to talk to you, man. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. You too. Um, so yeah, well, thank you everybody. And we will sign out. Let me just find that button. <laughs> and, right, later. Uh, yeah. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>